Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a beautiful brand new day. It's Wednesday and it's afternoon. Yes. <laughs> Hello over there in the UK across the pond, Janet. It's great to have you with us. Good morning, Kimberly. It's good to have you with us uh, from the other side of Michigan here. Danielle. Hey, Donna. Good to have you with us as well. The chat room is filling up and filing in. It's good to have everybody with us. Uh, this morning, I have a very special guest. Not only is she a dear friend and one of those friends that really has become family, I have Nicole Fix with us. And uh, Nicole is a therapist. She's a counselor and uh, really a remarkable woman. And this morning, we're going to be talking about, you know, the fact that our home is supposed to be a sacred space and that it's supposed to be a safe and healthy space to be. And here we are finding ourselves cooped up in our homes during this time. And a whole lot of things are happening inside the four walls and inside our minds and our emotions and our bodies and our spirit. And uh, Nicole is here to help all of us through this time. Good morning, Nicole Fix. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you with all of us this morning, and the chat room is full. And of course, everybody, we welcome your questions. Hey, Del Marie, Sonia, Donna, cousin Donya, good to have you here. Um, Nicole, yesterday when you and I were chatting about doing this show this morning or having a show about this subject, it really was predicated upon the fact that. Home is supposed to be a safe space, whether we are there alone by ourselves in our home, or now many of us are finding ourselves with family members that we're not used to being with during the day, whether it's our own children, maybe our spouse, our significant other. And on top of dealing with a global pandemic, we're learning how to be with people that we're normally not with 24-7. Yes, that's a good point. I mean, there are a lot of people feeling very cooped up. And, um, you know, any person that we're with for a long period of time, there's going to be some strain there in that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so, including with ourselves. Well, exactly. And I kind of wanted to talk about some of these things this morning, beginning with A lot of people, I believe, finding themselves working from home thought that maybe working from home would be a time where they could find some peace and quiet or they've always wanted to work from home or, oh, this is going to be great. I don't have to travel to the office every day or to the factory, whatever it happens to be, only to find out that the routine of driving to a place of employment every day and the routine of the people, the job, all of a sudden it's gone. And that disruption in and of itself is something that can cause anxiety. How do you feel about that? You bring up a really great point. I mean, I think we, <clears throat> a lot of us thrive off of structure and routine. And then when that gets disrupted, um, you know, home is typically this place for relaxation and um, when it becomes kind of this place for work too, you really have to reevaluate the structure of your life at home and how you want that to look to kind of get some kind of routine to be normal from the home environment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just thinking about, you know, driving to work can be a time of contemplation or reflection or you listen to a podcast, you drink your coffee, or mm -hmm. you talk to someone on the phone, um, but it is part of our day-to-day -day structure. Right. It reminds me of, you know, years ago when I retired from the newspaper in 2012, and I had been going to that job for 33 years at the Grand Rapids Press. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's going to be wonderful. I can focus on the temple within. <laughs> Isn't this just marvelous? Mm -hmm. And it took me a very long time to be able to fit myself into a new routine. 
that yeah so it's such a good point there with like retiring or I'm thinking of when I had Sophia my daughter mm-hmm. um and the very that that is such a transition point too of working full-time and then I'm suddenly like the stay-at-home mom with a baby and you know in my jammies all day so you know <clears throat> finding kind of like I know for me one of the things I have to do that makes me feel good is I still have to I still have kind of the structure in the morning. I get up, I, you know, meditate, I exercise, I take a shower and make breakfast and things um, that are really important for me to feel good. You know, while it can be nice for some people to work from their pajamas um, or from the pajamas down, that's awesome. It doesn't work for everybody. So kind of getting in touch with what a new normal might be Mm -hmm. for for us as we navigate new territory. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was going to ask you about that. You know, in the morning, I still get up because I have a company to run the temple within. um, And I get up, I have my routine in the morning, and every day is the same day. But for those that find themselves with the ability to suddenly be in their pajamas every day, you're suggesting that maybe one of the things that can remain the same and feel normal is to get up and to continue to do the normal routine before they begin their day at home. Yes. Yes. Whatever that may look like, or, you know, I'm changing it a little bit. Maybe you get to sleep in a little bit extra or, um, you know, and thinking during that drive time too, of maybe that's time where you sit and reflect with your coffee on the deck or on the couch or, mm-hmm whatever. It reminds me of our good friend, Laura Smith. (laughs) Laura, if you're listening, (laughs) how every morning on her way to work, and she talks about this all the time, it's her time with God every morning from the moment she leaves her driveway until she gets to New Kirk Electric uh, there along the coast um, of Lake Michigan. She's in conversation. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who has made that part of their day, I love your suggestion of, okay, do that out on the lanai, do it in Mm -hmm. the living room, but continue to do that because it brings a sense of safety, don't you think? Yes, it's very um, centering. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, I think especially before we work and, you know, dealing with just this, the anxiety of this pandemic is, you know, the importance of being centered um, within ourselves and, you know, what does that look like for each individual? Mm -hmm. Because it's different for each of us. Right. Well, this morning, just before our show, my sister Barbara called and I said, well, what are you doing? And she said, well, you know, I'm grounded (laughs) because (laughs) Barbara is a whirling dervish. I mean, she, she's up in the morning and pretty soon she's in her car and she's all over South Dakota doing something. But she was talking to me about the fact that she's staying home to keep herself safe and to keep everyone else safe. And it's kind of a struggle for her to not be out and about and doing her everyday thing. So she focuses on the fact that she's helping others to stay safe. And she was telling me that she's taking this time to really consider um you know, she was talking about life insurance and all those kind of things that she's just been too busy to take care of. And now she's having the time to take a look at such things like life insurance policies and all those technical things, trying to to maintain some sense of normalcy. One of the things that you and I talked about, well, you, I, and David Sturkin kind of had a thread going yesterday about the fact that you know, right now, as we're all trying to stay well for ourselves and for others, and we are at home trying to to have a sense of normalcy, for some people, their home is not a safe space. And going to work, going to school um, is a break from a place that's supposed to be safe and well. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. I am thinking of just, you know, domestic violence, um, child abuse, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe even new, like it's such new stress on parents too. And um, 
Yeah, and just um, the anxiety of dealing with uh, kids all day can, you know, that can be stressful. Mm -hmm. Um, And then trying to work or maybe losing one's job Mm -hmm. um, and now being suddenly faced with financial implications and um, how to navigate all of that. Um, So, yeah, that puts a lot of stress on people and some people handle that stress um, by being abusive. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, which can be traumatic in and of itself to not only just, I'm just thinking of how it's, you know, traumatic to the person receiving the abuse, but also to the abuser. Right. Um, Right. So, yeah, this whole cycle of abuse that um, gets perpetuated when we're home more. Mm -hmm. Um, and thinking, I'm just thinking too, of how working with kids, you know, and I work with kids on an inpatient psychiatric unit, how, um, we're busier during school year, the school year, because, um, reports get made by teachers and counselors and things. Um, but we don't see the kids as much in the summer because, um, there's no one there that's typically able to protect them like a teacher could. Mm -hmm. Um, Janet Smith, our dear friend Janet from over there in the UK is with us, and she's a nurse. And uh, thank you to everybody who's still out there in and amongst the people doing what it is that needs to be done so that the rest of us can stay home. Thank you all for for doing that. We appreciate each and every one of you. And in response to what you're saying, Janet is saying that you know she's really worried about what the fallout from all of this is going to look like when it's safe for everyone to come out, the psychological fallout. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's going to be um, intense. We're all, we're all undergoing trauma right now as a collective. And then we've got personal traumas that are happening, right? If there's abuse going on in the home, um, whether it be physical, emotional, sexual, um, or witnessing violence between parents, that's, traumatic as well Mm -hmm. Um, so and then you know that is is a great deal of trauma but then just the trauma of experiencing this epidemic that's this pandemic that's happening right so um i know a lot of insurance companies blue cross blue shield and blue care network for one those are two that i um am paneled with and can build they um, are waiving co-pays and deductibles I'm being told for um, behavioral health, for telehealth, um, which is amazing because knowing the strain on people right now, Mm -hmm. the psychological strain. um, So, you know, getting those services to people is really important. And right now you are offering telehealth services, correct? Yes, yes. Um, Yeah, so it's, you know, I have it through an electronic health record, so it's still, it's HIPAA compliant and confidential um, and safe from, like, the Zoom bombing that I'm hearing about. Uh Um, So, which is, you know, nice to just have that kind of safe space and um, still able to provide, you know, support to clients virtually. Mm -hmm. Um, Because everyone, everyone is experiencing this this world stress together. Well, it is. And one of the things that I think is so beautiful about what you're offering and what I've noticed, at least with my clients, with myself, is that we're home and we're inside our home. And as Barbara was talking about this morning, talking about, you know, some documents maybe that she needs to update. I think a lot of us are taking a look at our past We're taking a look at our future and maybe we're worried about it. And we're taking a look, I believe, even in our homes, because a lot of people have been doing some really early spring cleaning, taking a look at family photo albums, taking those mental, emotional, spiritual strolls down memory lane. And in times of quiet, which many people avoid specifically for this reason, because it gives us time to think about and begin to process things that we haven't, all of a sudden, a pandemic is going on outside of us. And pretty soon, for some people, a pandemic begins to build up within us of things that we haven't really looked at and healed. 
And I love the fact that you are working with people, um, via, you know, whether it's the phone or video conferencing. Again, it's private. What you have is a very private service with all of the HIPAA laws, et cetera. And I think that now is a wonderful time for people to let loose of the baggage that they've been carrying around, don't you think? Yes, yes. And I think a lot of that is coming up for people in the stillness, right? We're all being confined to these four walls that really represent symbolically our inner, you know, interior. Mm -hmm. We always talk about the interior castle and that. So we're being forced to sit in stillness with this external chaos. Well, so well said, that's bringing up this internal chaos. Um, and, you know, how do we deal with that? Because a lot of the mechanisms that we've used to deal with it before, whether it be busyness, you know, workaholic, or, um, you know, distraction, whatever, are suddenly gone in mm-hmm. many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're having to find new ways to manage that internal distress. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, I just posted on our or in our chat room, Nicole, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, Janet, maybe you could share what the uh, number there is in the UK. Uh, Because, you know, my friend Janet Schnell down there in the south of Indiana, she is a suicidologist. And uh, she it actually she surprised me some time ago when she educated me about the fact that this time of the year is actually when suicides uh, peak. Mm -hmm. And suicide hotlines are available. Mm -hmm. Uh, For those of you that are listening, you can't see the chat. The number here in the United States is 1-800-273-8255. And Janet is going to share the number there uh, in the UK with us shortly. So, you know, as I said the other day in our text message, shit's getting real Mm -hmm. for a lot of people. It's one thing if you think that you can hang out in your house for maybe a week, maybe a couple of weeks with somebody that you love. I mean, that can be trying enough. Todd and I were chuckling about that the other night. And this is kind of the norm for us to be together. But it's a nasty nightmare for some people to be stuck in a home with someone that they try to escape from every day from, you know, with work, et cetera. And what about the people that are now trapped with somebody who is addicted that no longer has the outlet of going to the pub? Or what about people who are in recovery and are not able to get to an AA meeting? Right. Well, relapse is is really big, you know, right now. Um, I do know that AA, which is so incredible, they are offering Zoom meetings um, daily. So I would encourage anyone, you know, if they're struggling with sobriety, um, to reach out to their local AA chapter, and they will connect you with a sponsor and um, with a Zoom meeting that they're doing daily. That's wonderful. Thank you for letting us know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, In my client base, somebody reached out to me to say, you know, now all of a sudden it was okay because in the evening, you know, he would come home late from the bar or whatever and just go to bed. And now I'm having to live with it Mm -hmm. and I'm having to see it and the children are having to see it. So a lot of times when we talk about Alcoholics Anonymous, we can also talk about um, Al-Anon. We can talk about, you know, services that are available for families. As a therapist, as a counselor, what do you what do you say to the spouse, male or female, who's having to watch and endure what's in, unfolding at home? And how do they protect themselves and their children in lockdown? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would be, I, I am sure that the Y um, WCA is still offering support for women um, that are 
you know, experiencing and families, kids as well that are experiencing domestic violence. Um, so having some kind of safety plan is going to be crucial. Um, you know, and wanting to, it's hard because you want to protect the kids, um, but they hear and see and feel, um, anyways. So, um, there's no easy answer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I wish that there were, but it's, um, you know, you give, there, there's risks with, you know, being passive and then there's risks in being fighting back and being aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, so having a support of someone, um, like that crisis line you offered is, is a wonderful support. Um, and I also have heard, um, that there's, you know, doctors are, there's a code word for doctors, um, which I don't know if anyone in the chat room could look up, but just, um, I want to say it's like, you know, you can have this doctor appointment and they use a code word if you need support. Um, and I should know, but I don't. Um, so ways to get support, I guess, you know, I would certainly encourage, um, having a safe space, um, in the, in the house that you can go to, um, if that's possible, as well as outside, mm -hmm. um, even a neighbor, mm -hmm. um, because safety is priority. Mm -hmm. Um, so whatever that may look like with a friend, a neighbor, you know, a doctor, the mm -hmm. crisis line therapist, whatever. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing you say is at the very least reach out. Yes. Reach yes, out. Yes. YWCA. Exactly. Yes. And for those of you that are thinking, well, now maybe it's my time to reach out to Nicole Fix. She has a company called Eastern Door Counseling, LLC. And so her website is easterndoorcounselingllc.com. And if you would like to get in touch with her, Eastern Door Counseling, LLC at gmail.com is her email. And I know that she will be happy to set up an appointment for you. Del Marie is in the chat and she is saying, I read that domestic violence is on the rise here in Colorado and maybe it is because of the alcohol or drug addiction. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think that is probably very true of people, um, you know, people that are alcoholics or abusing substances oftentimes have this dual diagnosis of having mental health um, symptoms. So when you take away the coping mechanism, which can often be the substance, um, or you add on more stress, which we're experiencing right, right now, right? Mm -hmm. And if people are experiencing it, you know, financially, um, physically, whatever, it's going to make you want to use more for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and then, you know, there's such a control element, like a, like a, um, you know, this feeling out of control, you mm -hmm. know, abuse, it can be such this power and control cycle. So when someone's feeling out of control, which I think everyone is on some element in some aspect, right. Um, you want to get in control and how do you get in control? Well, you know, for an abuser, you're going to be abusive for an addict. You're going to, you know, use substances. Um, so I think getting in touch with those inner feelings is so crucial because a lot of us, you know, we have a society that's really taught us not to be, not to allow feelings. Um, you know, so one of the things I do as a therapist, one of my biggest things is just normalizing feelings and teaching people how to regulate their emotions by feeling them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and just to continue in that regard, it's, it's pretty easy to do. We have to acknowledge our feelings that we're having feelings. And then you can get like this simple list of emotions and being able to go through, identify, label an emotion. You got to name it to tame it and, and have allow that feeling to be. So if it's feeling like helplessness, 
um, fear, Mm -hmm. terror, people Mm -hmm. are feeling feeling terrified. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Feelings actually only last 60 to 90 seconds, but that's if we let ourselves have the feeling in the first place. So much of the struggle is not allowing ourselves to feel. Um, So just, you know, coming back to this place of people that are wanting to get more in touch Mm-hmm. With emotions are wanting to, you know, deal with that inner chaos without using, and you know, that support is a big factor, but then also getting into a space of allowing yourself to have feelings. I like that. Thank you for sharing that, Nicole. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. And so we've got those of us that are indoors um, doing our work uh, Todd is an essential worker, and so he's fast at work, but he, his office is here in our home. And there are a lot of essential workers that are out on the front lines. My son is the mechanic at the Grand Rapids Press. He is the dude that takes care of those press machines, the press printing machines. That's his ballywig. So every day he goes in to take care of those uh, printing presses as the mechanic, and sometimes he's called in to print the newspaper in the evening, and I know that he has anxiety about being out there with people, and every day he texts me, you know, usually begins in the morning, and sometimes it ends in the evening, about what it's like for him to go to work, and his outlet has always been the gym every day without fail going to the gym and it's been a process for him to find other ways to let some steam off especially now because as an essential employee life has changed and our essential employees that are out there in the public are experiencing a trauma that many of us don't see because we're in our homes. They're out there seeing it, touching it, uh, being with it. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Mm-hmm. And they bring it home at night because it's in their energy, it's in their aura, it's in their psyche. What do you recommend? Because right now, I love the fact that you are uh offering your services to first responders and essential workers uh, as well right now. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them about diffusing some of what they're seeing and experiencing out there in the public? Right. It's so important to process it. It's so important to express it in a healthy way by, you know, feeling those feelings, getting in touch with those feelings, um, And, you know, having someone that you can talk to about it and what it's like to be experiencing that is crucial. Um, Or if you don't have anyone that you feel like you can talk to, you know, you can always, you know, reaching out to the the talk line, the crisis line um, is available and a great resource for that. Um, You know, I'm offering reduced rates um, for first responders and essential workers. and I, a lot of therapists are as well. Um, but then also through expression, it's, it's so important, whether it be journaling, maybe listening to music that allows you to move those feelings through your body, you know, sadness or anger, um, helplessness. Those are such tough emotions to feel. And then, you know, we're all being forced to feel them, especially those of us that are still considered essential. And, um, you know, we're being forced as a collective to deal with our own vulnerability to sickness, to losing our jobs, um, to losing our lives. So um, there's just such a great deal of vulnerability right now. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, there's a lot coping skills are really, really crucial. Um, so again, like listening to music or journaling or reading a book, um, maybe coloring or drawing, doing a puzzle, um, things that can really distract your mind. Um, and, and, you know, some of those ways are ways of working through those feelings and emotions too. So I like that. Yeah. Practical ways of Mm -hmm. journeying through, this is a journey. We're journeying something uh, together. And as Ram Das always said, we're all just walking each other home. 
And right now we've kind of hit a hairpin curve in walking each other home. And what is that going to look like? I know for myself, Todd and I um, have been talking about, so, you know, when we're able to go out and about again, other than here in the enchanted forest, what is that going to look like? And what are our shopping habits going to look like? And what is it that we really need? And what are we going to do moving forward to make this world a better place? And I think that we've all been seeing glimpses of that. So maybe part of what we can do when we're stuck in these situations and trying to look at something good is to focus on maybe how we can help going forward or the things that are being revealed right now. I love the almost daily photographs on Instagram of skyways and airways that are now free of pollution mm-hmm. and, and focusing on cleaning up the oceans. And I think that part of, and I don't believe that that's escapism. I think that that's really taking a look at how we can all contribute and what does that mean in our own home rather than to sit on the sofa like a potato, but to really think about life is changing. We cannot go back to the way things were. We can't go back in time. We're all marching forward. And maybe as hard as it is, leaving the alcoholic spouse You know, some of us have done that. Mm -hmm. Leaving an abusive spouse, some of us have done that. Maybe these are opportunities for us to think about personally as well going forward and what we will have in our lives and what we won't. And, you know, being in a room with your children, watching them endure abuse in the home sometimes is the impetus that a parent needs in order to make a really drastic, hard change. So I think sometimes spending time looking forward can be useful, especially when we have someone such as yourself um, or a loved one or maybe a rabbi or a priest that can help us through it. How do you feel about that, Nicole? Yeah, no, and that is so such a great you know thing to emphasize is that you know there is a way to like find inspiration and meaning in this to make changes you know and and making it's forcing some people to like get into action mode who may otherwise have not been Mm -hmm. um and knowing you know that there is there are a lot of really good things happening through this as well like you know like the ozone leader and pollution being cleared up and the dolphins swimming in the canals in Italy, Mm -hmm. you know, um, just the, the beautiful things that are happening. So yeah, using it as like an impetus to change. And, uh, a lot of clients I've talked to too, like I'm realizing how busy I was. I was working too much. It's so wonderful. I'm catching up on sleep and, Mm -hmm. you know, time to, um, do things, maybe, you know, get these projects done that have long been put off and finding a lot of value in that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it's important that we seek meaning through this, you know, and we can do that in tandem with, you know, honoring our emotions, which I believe to be sacred, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, the difficulty and the meaning. Mm -hmm. One of the, as we get ready to wrap up, Nicole, there's one thing that I wanted to address. Maybe you could help us through. Um, Yesterday, I was standing in the kitchen. I was washing dishes. I'm somebody that likes to wash them by hand and look out the window. I'm one of those people. And I was washing dishes, and this little voice within me said, many of your elders are leaving right now in order to assist from the other side. And it really struck me because the the people that are really being lifted from Grandmother Earth at this time by the pandemic virus are many of our elders. And there is anguish on this side, of course, when we lose a loved one. 
People are not in many places being offered the opportunity to grieve, to say goodbye, to be at the funeral home, to deliver mom or dad's favorite outfit, right? To put them in their casket. Is that something that you can help people through? And what do you suggest for people that their loved one has died off in a hospital and they won't have anything to do with them until they're able to go pick up the urn of ashes? It's, I I just think of grief and the way that grief works, um, you know, and the importance of feeling those feelings, you know, it is devastating. It's shocking. Um, it's normal to feel, you know, angry and even rageful, um, to, you know, experience sadness. There's, I I don't know if you're familiar with the five stages of grief. Um, that would be something I would want to educate people on is, you know, allowing yourself to go through these stages of grief, um, which you can easily Google. I think it's Elizabeth Kugler Ross. Yeah. Yeah. That has them and they've even added a sixth stage someone independent of her um I don't know if she's since passed but has added on a sixth stage of meaning um meaning making after acceptance um anyway just as a side note but going through I mean there's shock um there's bargaining and guilt um where you know first we're shocked and then we are bargaining we feel guilty what could we have done um you know part of you know that shock piece too um but then also there's sadness there's anger and then there's acceptance Mm -hmm. and it's really normal to go through all of those stages you know all within um you know they can be separate but they also can be so intertwined Mm -hmm. so um allowing yourself to go through those those phases Mm -hmm. and you know ideally you have someone that loved them equally as much as you that is so crucial to like be talking to them um to be processing through it together um you know and and when someone is ready to be reminiscing you know about that that person's life Mm -hmm. um like you said going through old photo albums and Mm -hmm. you know just getting nostalgic because that nostalgic this nostalgia can be so healing and and helpful and kind of balancing the grief Mm -hmm. um, with with us as we keep living Mm -hmm. Uh, Kimberly Wink is (laughs) she's saying I'm washing more dishes also I do I like to do it by hand I always have Mm -hmm. Because it is meditative, Donna Pascaretta, you are right on about that. Um, you know, how can we help people who are experiencing uh, the passing of a loved one? Well, the, the thing that I would offer from my perspective in my life is that no one dies alone. They may pass away without a, the physical presence of somebody in the room, but no one no one at the time of their passing passes alone. Those that love us from the other side, our ancestors, our beloved four-leggeds, right, our pets, they also come to greet us. We all do have beings of light. Some call them guardian angels. Some call them the shining ones uh, from Creator that comes to welcome the return of our soul back to the vast consciousness of creator. And so I want anyone who's listening right now who feels that their loved one died in abject aloneness, that did not happen. It did not happen. And for those of us that are missing the rite or the ritual of funeral, because funeral is ritual, Preparing a body for that funeral or cremation, that is a ritual. And many humans, not everybody, likes ritual because it's part of our psyche to prepare for birth and death. And one of the most beautiful things I think any of us can offer those that are experiencing loss. You all know me and you know that here in my home, I have a particular altar that is dedicated to those that need a prayer. If it's somebody that you love who has passed on, build your own small altar. It can simply be 
um, a photo of them and a candle. Speak to them. Speak to their spirit. Speak to their soul. Let them know how much you loved them. Let them know that they mattered. Let them know that it's okay for them to move on. Invite your ancestors to be there to assist them on the other side. One of the most beautiful things I think that people forget about who they are is that you do not have to be licensed to be a minister. I'm an ordained minister, and so I went through all of the education and blah, blah, blah to become that. But to help somebody pass through the cycles of their life, a piece of paper is not required. And a lot of people forget that or they never knew that. Our soul connection to people is all that is needed. Our love connection to people is all that is needed and required to help somebody. If we know that somebody is in the hospital and they are in need of assistance, again, lighting up a candle, offering a prayer, talking to the spirit of that person. Somebody does not have to be physically dead in order to talk to the spirit of that person. Um, when a child is preparing to be born, we often talk to the spirit of the child uh, before it's it's out of the mother's womb. Right? This is soul communication we're talking about. Create a sacred space. Have your own ceremony. Create your own ritual. It does not have to be done in a funeral home if one is not available, or a church, a synagogue, a temple, an ashram. It can be done in the backyard. It's about connecting soul to soul. And I can assure you, in my 57 years of speaking to people who have passed on from the physical realm, no one, not even our four-leggeds or our feathery ones, crosses over alone. There is, there is a word that Nicole used this morning, and the word is grace. There is a divine grace that goes beyond religion. It goes beyond spirituality, race, creed, call, any of it. It's divine grace. It's that light that connects us to every living thing. And if you need further help, because maybe the person who's passed, you have unresolved issues, you can also talk to them, you know, reach out to their spirit. Talk to them as though they're right there in the room, because chances are they probably are in their spirit body. If you need further help with that, then you can reach out to Nicole. You can reach out to your rabbi, your minister, your spiritual leader, a shaman, to get assistance. But know that you are not disempowered in this time. You're not disempowered. I hope that that was, that was helpful uh, for beautiful. people. Um, I think that a lot of people are also maybe reconsidering church. Maybe they're reconsidering that they want to go to church now more, or maybe they're reconsidering the fact that they feel more sacred in their own space. Whatever that is, it's okay. Think about it. Ponder it. If you need somebody to walk you through it, one of the best things about Nicole Fix is that, yes, she is a therapist. She's a counselor. She's extraordinary, but she's also a deeply spiritual woman. Mm -hmm. And she understands body, mind, spirit, emotions, all of it. So I hope, Kimberly, that that was helpful. And uh, as we are wrapping up with our morning, what, what is it that you would like to leave people with, Nicole, at this time? Because we are passing through, I, I call it a collective dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. Right here at Easter time, which I find so fascinating on many levels. But it is a dark night. And whenever there's a dark night, we always emerge out into the light. Would you talk about what you would share with people pertaining to that? Yeah, I love that you call it a dark night. I'm equally calling it that as a collective. And yeah, um, and I'm just thinking of the great paradox of life of, you know, I, my sister used a good analogy of, you know, I, I liken what's happening to kind of that wild wildfire that, you know, sets and is so destructive 
yet through that destruction is the symbolic rebirth, right? Mm -hmm. Um, New things are allowed to grow that may have taken years, decades, generations to happen. I mean, I do think that we're going to come out of this. um, um, You know, yes, there will be some wounds there, certainly emotional wounds, but they will allow us, um, you know, this new lens through which to look at the values that we have as individuals, as a society, as a collective, um, and how we want our world to look that it may have taken again, you know, years and years to reach. So really exploring what those values may be and how we want to contribute, um, to the world, um, moving through and out of this, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we do have more power than we've been, than we've thought. And and how do we want to use that? Mm -hmm. I love that. I keep thinking to myself, when this phase of our journey, our collective journey is complete, how many new artists, or maybe artists that have been all along, or musicians that have been all along, or writers, philosophers, that now have the time to pick that paintbrush back up, to pick up that guitar or piano or violin, the herbalists now have the time to pick up maybe what they tucked away a long time ago. I can't wait to see what has been created that will emerge. Oh, I love that analogy. From all of this. I'm thinking too of how I tell Sophia, like when she's like, I'm bored. I'm like, well, that's great. I love that you're bored because that's right before the creativity hits, right? (laughs) So we're being sparked this inspiration through, you know, being confined to that. Yeah. The inspiration to paint again Mm -hmm. or to write again. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, everybody, thank you for joining Nicole and I uh, this morning. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us and offering wonderful practical ways for all of us to move through this and to move into what is becoming. And of course, everyone, uh, as Nicole said, she is uh, running telehealth consultations right now. And you can reach out to her at Eastern Door Counseling LLC at gmail.com. That is her her email and visit her website, please. Eastern door counseling, LLC.com. Remember, this is not a time where you have been disempowered. This is a time for you to collect up all of who you are and all of who you are becoming. So with that, everyone, Hey, Tara, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. You're welcome. Have a beautiful day, everybody and shine from where you are. Just shine. Blessings be everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you.